So you're saying a huge community of people knew before the world did that Charles Manson committed these murders? Yeah. Parks went on to say something even more dizzying. He was positive that the FBI had sent agents to the Beach Boys office soon after the murders. They were monitoring our phones because they thought there was some connection with those guys, he said. They were sitting in my office, picking up my telephone. I'm sure they had the phones tapped, but they weren't sharing information with us. He told the FBI about Manson early on, but they didn't seem to act on his tip. I didn't know why they weren't doing anything, and everybody else was just trying to stay out of the situation. For the Beach Boys, we didn't want that kind of publicity, and neither did anybody else. Steve Despar, the Beach Boys recording engineer, remembered the ordeal that Manson had put him through during the recording sessions, when he'd showed up with about 12 girls, many underage, quiet, in a stupor. The group smelled so foul that the studio's management, at the behest of Brian Wilson's wife, soon installed a sanitary bathroom seat. In the control room, Manson, reeking, would pull out a knife and clean his fingernails, wave it around and gesture. After three sessions, Despar was fed up. He called the Beach Boys manager and said, I refuse to be alone with him. The guy is psychotic and scares the hell out of me. Despar emphasized he was after Melcher. Melcher was not out of the picture at this point. He was part of the project. When I was recording Charles Manson, it was for Dennis and Terry Melcher. For a lay person. Melcher would never admit that. And I didn't want to talk to him again until I'd done my due diligence. Fortunately, in the archives of the L.A. County Sheriff's Office, LASO, I soon stumbled on further proof that Melcher had visited Manson after the murders. LASO had records of an interview with Paul Watkins, another key member of the family who testified against Manson. He too saw Melcher at the Spawn Ranch, around the same time as Danny DiCarlo had, the first week of September 1969. What he told the unnamed interviewer was shocking to me. Melcher was on acid, was on his knees, asked Manson to forgive him. Terry Melcher failed to keep an appointment, called him a pig. They are all little piggies. Helter Skelter meant for everyone to die. Charlie gave Greg Jacobson a 45 slug and said, give Dennis Wilson this and tell him I have another one for him. This was even more explosive than the files from the DA, I realized. Not only did it suggest that Melcher had some bizarre debt to Manson, it opened up Watkins to accusations of perjury. Just like DiCarlo, Watkins had omitted these details from his testimony. He made no mention of having seen Melcher at the Spawn Ranch in early September 1969, much less having seen him on acid begging for forgiveness. As much as the Watkins interview buttressed my case for a cover-up, it brought a host of new questions. Why did Melcher need Manson's forgiveness? Did he know that it was he who was supposed to die that night? Had Manson instilled much more fear in him than anyone had ever known? And what had compelled Bugliosi to believe that he could hide the true extent of their relationship? I wondered how many other stories like this had been kept secret. Now I felt I had a stronger shot at grabbing Melcher's attention. Maybe even at getting him to concede that he'd lied. First, though, I had to contend with Bugliosi. As the summer faded into autumn, in the first year of my reporting, I had a hunch that Vince was keeping close tabs on me, even monitoring my progress in a way. Altabelli had suggested that Vince was always asking about me trying to undermine my credibility. He thought I was only masquerading as a magazine journalist. When I heard about Melcher's puzzling remark, Vince was supposed to take care of all that, I'd made a conscious decision to distance myself from Bugliosi. Although we'd once spoken on an almost weekly basis, I hadn't been in touch with him since June. 
One day in October, I came home to find that he left a message on my machine. I need to talk to you about something, he said, sounding unusually serious. This was it, I thought. I set up my tape recorder and called him back. How you doing, buddy? He answered, sounding manic. Listen, are you still working on this thing? Then he added, someone, I don't remember who, called me. If there's something about my handling of the case, but anything at all that you had a question about, I would appreciate if you would call me to get my view on it. I think I did a fairly good job, and I can't think of things that I would do differently. But for a layperson, they may look at it and say, he should not have done this, this is improper, or what have you, and I'd like to at least be heard. I told him I would absolutely give him a chance to be heard, and that I did, in fact, have some questions, but I didn't have them ready yet. Okay, he said. Yeah, call me, because there may be a justification or reason why I did something that, as a layperson, you would not know. Now I was positive that he had some notion of what I'd been researching, whom I'd been talking to. I mentioned that I'd made halting progress on the piece, which was still expected for premiere, even if it was running behind schedule. The Melcher angle, I said, wondering if he'd take the bait, had been so impossible to get. Were you ever able to get in touch with Terry? He asked. I said I was. Oh, you have talked to him. You got him on the phone? Vince's surprise was evident, but I couldn't tell if it was feigned or not. I felt like he was hoping to keep me talking, to feel out my progress. I got off the phone as soon as I could. I didn't hear from him again until December, just a few days before Christmas, when he left a phone message asking for my address. He said he wanted to send me a CD of some songs by Manson that a guy playing Manson in a movie had given him. When I didn't return the call, he left another message the next day to make sure I understood that the music was very rare and not otherwise available. I didn't return that call either. But the same night, I got a call from Altabelli, who said that Vince had called him twice that day wanting to know what you're doing. Their second conversation ended in a shouting match, Altabelli said. After he started asking Bugliosi about some of the information I'd shared over the previous months, that was enough for me. I wouldn't speak to Vince again for seven years. On Melcher's Roof When my piece for premiere was more than a year late, I knew I had to talk to Melcher again and to put my full weight on him. I wanted this conversation to bring my reporting to a close. Then I could file my piece, finally. Months of constant interviewing had honed my strategy. If I could get someone on the phone in a talkative mood, I'd suggest an in-person meeting that same day, which would minimize the chance that they'd get cold feet. I'd be ready to go at a moment's notice, showered and dressed, with notes, questions, documents, and tape recorders in my bag by the door. Such was the case on the day I phoned Melcher, July 3, 2000. Surprisingly, he picked up. Even more surprisingly, I caught him in a lively frame of mind. Most surprisingly of all, he said he'd meet me on the roof of his apartment building in 15 minutes. I bolted out the door and drove over to his high-rise on Ocean Avenue in Santa Monica, dwelling all the while on his choice of venue. His rooftop? I imagined some kind of bleak, desolate place the sun beating down on us as ventilation fans whirred. Instead, I bounded into his lobby and took the elevator up to find a rooftop lounge with a bar, a pool, and a kingly view of the Santa Monica Bay. Melcher lived in one of the penthouse suites, and there he was, sitting on a couch with a drink in his hand. Though it was a gorgeous day, and anyone in these luxury suites could access the roof lounge, we were alone up there. He was wearing a gold shirt and aviator glasses that he didn't take off until midway through our conversation.